Hello, I'm Jim Halfpenny, and I welcome you to a gathering of naturalists. The gathering is hosted by a naturalist world, an ecological education company located at the north entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Our company sponsors educational programs and research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We also host this free lecture series, A Gathering of Naturalists, which highlights the knowledge and expertise of those who live, study, and love the ecosystem. Now, please join us for our program. Thank you. Thank all of you for joining us um, for this talk. I am the park archeologist here at Yellowstone National Park, which means I uh, manage the park's archeology span program and the staff that assist me with that. And what I'd like to talk about today is about 10,000 years of people, uh, 10,000, 12,000 years of people on the land. And what I'd like to do is give you some archeological context, some context about the archeology span here in the park, how things have changed through time, what we've learned. And then I'd like to go into several of the, just a few of the projects and some of the most recent um, research findings that we have, including things that have not yet been shown before. So this is what I've been working on this winter from last summer. But before I start, I wanna acknowledge that we have 27 associated tribes here. These tribes have historic connections to the lands and resources that are now found within Yellowstone National Park. Um, so a lot of the archeology, span what I'll be talking about is related to their ancestors. And many of the peoples who are associated with Yellowstone have various names for different features in the park. These are only a few. So we have the Shoshone, the Kiowa, the Crow, the Blackfeet, Flathead, the Bannock. Uh, we also have the Arapaho, we have the Lakota and Dakota tribes and several others. So I wanna acknowledge them. So what I do is I help manage archeological resources for the park. And the science of archeology span what we want to do is we want to understand how and why cultures have changed over time, including our own, and use that information to help us better plan for the future because we'll have a greater understanding of human behavior and why we do what we do. How do we make our lives? Archaeological resources are unique because it, they are really tangible links between the past and the present. The artifacts that we're holding and touching were left behind by um, peoples of the past, including the ancestors of our tribes. And these artifacts and the archeological sites, they keep and preserve and help us tell the story of Yellowstone. What's really important for me is not what I find, but what I find out. Archaeological resources are non-renewable, as in once we excavate them or once we remove them from the land, we, we can't repopulate that. We can't recreate those archaeological sites. We can't reintroduce them, if you will. So a lot of the archaeology, what we do is when we do the field work, we are very meticulous on recording every single piece of information where it was found, its original context, the relationship between that artifact and other artifacts, including other things known as features, such as hearths, building foundations. We call these things features because once you remove them, you, they, they, they're no longer together anymore. So those non-renewable resources, uh, we take very special care to make sure that we are trying to protect that information and protect this heritage for all future gen generations. So this is a, a map just showing you general locations of a portion of our archeological sites. We have over 1900 known archeological sites with less than 3% of the park inventoried. So as we move forward every year, we're continuously finding new sites. 
But what's unique with Yellowstone is because the park was formed so early on in 1872, a lot of these sites have not undergone timber or mining or farming. So they are as they were when the park was formed. And because of that, it gives us a really unique view over these 2.2 million acres and extending beyond that to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And it gives us a landscape view. Instead of just looking at one particular river valley or one particular plateau, we can look across this entire ecosystem to see how people were moving across this landscape. How are they interacting with these resources? What resources were they using? How are they making their lives? What were they eating? How are they building their homes? And we do this and we, by looking at different kinds of sites, and we do this also by dating. Now we use two different kinds of dating. We use radiocarbon dating, but we also use something called relative dating. So right here, I have two arrows up. And if you have a point found or a tool at the top arrow, and you have a tool found at the bottom arrow, by the law of superposition in geology, the one at the top of the sediment column will be younger because the lower uh, soils were placed first. For radiocarbon dating, if you look at that lower arrow, you see how there's a dark band in the sediment column? That's an early original uh, soil where it used to be the ground surface. And it's that darker color because it's been interacting with the organic materials, the trees, the plants, the leaves, and that gives it that darker, rich color. Anybody who does gardening or farming knows that really rich nutrient soil. If I have a point that was found either within or right above that dark layer, and I can get a radiocarbon date from that dark layer, I can say that that point, if it's found within it or right below it, is at least that age. I can't, if it's found above it, so for example, say that lower level, um, actually for this site was about 9,300 years old, say that lower level is 9,300 years old. If I find a point above that, I cannot say that that point is 9,300 years old. It's less than that. Below that, I can say it's 9,300 years old. And we also look at um, relative dating using projectile point typology and tool typologies. We find those at many different sites in the park. Uh, we have our most common type site type that we have here. We have lithic workshops and quarries where people are going to these different places and they're obtaining raw tool stone, which they will then reduce by flaking and different kinds of impacts to create these different tools. And if you look, you can see I only have three different examples up, but they have different shapes and they have different forms. So by finding these different shapes in association with radiocarbon dates, we get a rough timeline of what these different styles and when they appear through time. Other types of sites that we have here. Sorry, it's dry down in my lab. We have stone stuck structures, we have hunting blinds, we have cairns. On the lower left, you can see the remnants of a stone circle uh, right there. On the right, we interpret that as a hunting blind. We also have the remnants of wooden structures known as wikiups. Also, we have teepees and teepee rings. So one of the interpretations for the stone circle is that it might be a teepee ring. We also have historic sites. Here in the park, we have soldier stations. Three out of the 16 that are known are partially excavated. And these are some of the materials that were found there down on the lower left. We are also lucky enough that we have town sites. So we have the Cinnabar town site here within the park boundaries. And we have done excavation work at the Cinnabar Hotel which Roosevelt used as his temporary White House when he was here visiting the park. You may not think about it with Yellowstone being so inland, but we do also have shipwreck sites here in the park. 
So this is the EC Waters, which was abandoned in 1907, eventually it drifted to shore, landing in 1926, and where it still is today, out on Yellowstone Lake. So we do have shipwrecks here in the park. So those are just a couple of the different sites that we have. We also have historic roads, historic bridges, remnants of those um, different features. And what I wanna do is kind of shift and start talking about what we've been learning from the archeology span and talk about that kind of how people are coming into this landscape early on and how they're moving across this area through time. So the last glaciation, the peak of the Pinedale glaciation was either, was between 21,000 to 15,000 years ago. Uh, the Northern part of the park being 21,000 and the Southern part of the park being about 15,000 years ago. At its maximum, it was about 4,000 feet thick. Now, the reason why I bring that up is that we have early archeological sites throughout the Americas that are dating to 15,000 years ago or earlier. Here, we were not ice free until about 13 or 14,000 years ago. So that's why I'm starting at 12,000 years ago because once the ice retreated and the landscape began to be populated with the fauna and the flora, we find that people moved in soon after. I wanna take a segue on this because one of the things that we learn a lot from with using archeology span that I won't talk about too much later on is we can learn a lot about past, past climate change. So there's a, a site up in the Northern range and that site was through radiocarbon dating. We were able to determine that there was multiple occupations of that same area. If you think about it, what was once a good campsite is usually continuously a good place to go and camp. So the earliest occupation we had was radiocarbon dated to 9,500 years ago. Well, because of that, the question was, how was that site formed? So when geologists, the park geologists at the time analyzed the soils and did additional research, they were able to identify Glacial Lake Gardner. And Glacial Lake Gardner um, was created by a landslide in Yankee Jim Candon and extended into the park. So if you look at the lower right, the town of Gardner was underwater, the town of Electric was underwater, and it extends all the way up. Corwin Springs was underwater, all the way up into Yankee Jim Canyon. So archaeology has that unique perspective as it can also give a deep time scale. Uh, we also looked at the pollen that was recovered from the site. And we also look at the macro botanical or seeds and portions of plants and trees that were recovered to get a good idea of what the climate was like at that time. And in the earliest years, it was slightly wetter than it is now. So to give you a little perspective, on the left is about 11,000 years ago, 11 to 12,000 years ago. And we know that people were in the park through using relative dating. Moving towards the right, we become closer and closer to present day, with present day being all the way on the right. So how does this all piece together? Well, if we look down on the lower right, we have three basic time um, tool types that we find throughout, three basic types of tool technology that we have within the park. In the earliest paleo Indian period, uh, represented uh, by Clovis here in the park, we do have two fragments of Clovis projectile points here. Those tools are indicative of spear technology. And it's hard to tell what the relative scale on these, but these are about relative size to each other. Moving forward in time to what we call the archaic period, we start to see, instead of having these curved bases or stemmed bases, we start to see these notches in the sides of the points. And in the center photo on the left, what we have there is we have what's called an atlatl or dart flow. And that gives greater distance with incredible accuracy for being able to uh, launch these um, 
projectiles while you're hunting animals. And then moving even closer in time to us towards the late prehistoric, which is about 1500 years ago, we start to see the bow and arrow coming into this, this area. So what this means is if we're working and finding an archeological site, even if I don't find charcoal, but if I find one of these known tool types, I can still place that archeological site in time. If I find these known tool types, as well as radiocarbon dates that helps contribute not only to the greater yellow ecosystem, but these tool types are also found throughout the plains, all the way up into Canada, down into Texas. And so that helps refine our knowledge as well of how this technology is being adopted throughout this entire area of North America. Using these, radi these different types of dating and uh, tool types, we've been able to determine that obsidian cliff, people were here at least 11,500 years ago. Now, how do we do that? Every obsidian flow has a unique chemical sig signature, fingerprint, if you will. And if we find the tool, we can do a non-destructive analysis through x-ray fluorescence and get that fingerprint. And then if we know where quarries or the source material are, and we analyze those, we can match up those fingerprints. Archaeologists do this so that this helps us figure out how people were moving across the landscape. And we've been able to determine that we have over 50 quarry sites within the park itself, um, or quarry pit locations, I could say, many of which are around Obsidian Cliff. And there are 17 other obsidian sources within the park boundaries today. We find obsidian not just within the park boundaries. We find obsidian cliff is the widest distributed obsidian across North America. Uh, for example, 90% of the obsidian that was uh, found in the Hopewell mortuary sites in the Ohio River Valley, which is about 1800 to 1750 years ago, came from obsidian cliff. We consistently find obsidian coming from Idaho into the park, coming from down by Grand Teton and Montana into the park. We find obsidian from the park going out across North America as well. So we look at this distribution and it's important because it doesn't just tell us about the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, it tells us about North America as a whole. How are these trade networks operating continent wide? You know, it's really hard sometimes to do it with different kinds of material types. For example, if you're looking at a bone tool crafted from an animal, say bison, well, we know bison was found across North America. So it's really hard. So this is one way we can get at those different kinds of questions. Another aspect of archeology span in the park is that we also look at wildland fire um, sort of the natural processes. Kind of how are things impacting our sites? So one of the big research uh, topics that we've been working on is wildland fire impacts. We use the intensity of fire to examine what has happened when a fire has gone through. One of the dating methods that archeologists have used on obsidian is when obsidian is exposed to the atmosphere, it creates a rind. And that rind, think of like an orange peel, it builds up through time. But when you have a wildland fire, it burns off that, that coating and kind of resets the clock back to zero. So if we can figure out the wildland fire impacts where we have seen the greatest fire intensities, how does the fire move through the landscape? We can see how those impacting our sites. What may we have lost if we're looking at wooden sites, such as early wikiups? What is still there today? How can we best protect and manage the sites that we do have from these, inc these increasing uh, changes? One of the other natural processes that we look at is we look at erosion. 
And one of the most uh, famous sites here on the park is Osprey Beach. It's down on Yellowstone Lake. And there's actually four different occupations that we have for radiocarbon dates of Osprey Beach. So if you remember that first slide where I was talking with the two arrows showing that stratigraphy, think about it like this, it's a layer cake. And each layer is being built upon the other. At Osprey Beach, our earliest radiocarbon dates were from 9,300 years ago. And extensive excavations were conducted between 2000 and 2002 uh, by the Museum of the Rockies and Wichita State University. Before that, the site was found in the 1950s. And since then, we've been periodically, regularly visiting, the, visiting this site and monitoring its condition. Well, why are we doing that? Osprey Beach is the earliest occupation is related to what's known, what was known as the Cody complex. And it's now referred to sometimes as the Cody culture. It's known throughout the plains area of the US and into Canada. And it's called a complex because there's three distinctive types of projectile points or spear points that are used. And I want you to notice the square bases on those. And so at, at Osprey Beach, we, they were able to find hearth features to get those radiocarbon dates, a lot of stone tools, but it was the first Cody complex site that was recorded outside of the plains. It was found in high altitude in a lakeshore setting. Why is it called Cody complex? It's because the first site where this was identified was right near Cody, Wyoming. And in the top right, one of the most diagnostic tools for this culture, this Cody culture, is something that's referred to as the Cody knife. And it's this asymmetrical blade. We don't see it later on and we don't see it earlier than that. But some of the really other interesting artifacts that we found there is we didn't find a lot of wood artifacts, but if in the lower right, you see that we have these kind of ground stone. And what these are is these are sandstone, shaft abraders. So here our soils are really acidic and wood does not necessarily survive through time. However, these stone tools will. These abraders were used to straighten shafts. So these were used to straighten the spear shafts. So the blue arrow you would use by just rubbing the abrader on the spear shaft to get it straighter. And the straighter it is, the more accurate your aim will be as you are hunting for your food. Well, we've been continuously returning to Osprey Beach because we were able to learn so much about that. On those earlier tools, they conducted what's known as blood residue analysis on the points, and they found out some really interesting things. The blades of those points were having a positive anti-serum reactions, so the presence of animals, medium to large game animals, such as deer, bighorn sheep, bison, and even bear were found on those points. But on the stems of those points, you, they, we found blood residue for lagomorphs, rabbits and hares, felines and canines. So the, uh, the thought is that these medium to large game animals were being hunted for food while these smaller animals may have been trapped or hunted for more their pelts and their uh, sinew to be used to attach these points to those shafts. But we've been returning back periodically because the erosion has been continuing on. And so starting in 2019, we returned to the site to do some really in-depth analysis because what they did early on is they focused their excavations, if you look down on the lower left, right along the front of the bluff. And right along the front of the bluff is where, you get, where there's the most erosion. But they never, they didn't go back into the tree line. So we're not sure how far that site extends. And so we came back in 2019 and we started doing the work and we would put, uh, periodically we put augers at regular intervals extending from the shoreline back towards the tree line, not only to find out how far did the site go back 
But how far did each one of those four occupations go back? How far do we have? What is still there with this ongoing erosion? And as well, we also check the ground surface. So these are two new points that were just found. Um, if you look on the lower left, if you notice it's got that notching, it's very, very small. That would be your bow and arrow technology. And in the center, it has that wide square stem and that would be your uh, atlatl technology because it's a, a bit smaller. So if we look here, um, when we start plotting our data, um, in this, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but right through here, this is where the buff was in 2002. And if we follow it back through time, this is now where the bluff is. So if you look at these excavations on the right, all of that excavation has done, was completed where it has since eroded. And so we do this kind of information so we can see as it's moving, as the erosion continues to move across where the excavations were, it helps us plan how are we going to best be able to uh, retrieve information that may be lost through subsequent erosion coming in the next five, 10, 20, 30 years, et cetera. Other sites that we've looked at recently, the park in 2005 started a uh, analysis of looking at different sites within Yellowstone that were related to the 1877 flight of the Nez Perce. Uh, this is when Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce were, did, did not, it's a long complicated story to make it very quick. 800 members of the Nez Perce tribe of all ages, so from the very young to the very old, led by Chief Joseph, were leaving Northeast Oregon because they, did, they didn't wanna go up to be with other tribes on the Indian reservation. And it has a lot to do with who signed what treaties and different bands. And General O.O. Howard and his troops ended up following the Nez Perce and they came down through Yellowstone National Park before heading up to Northern Montana um, where the, it, it ended um, at Bear Paw National Historic Landmark when Chief Joseph surrendered. But within the park itself, it was really unique because remember the park was created in 1872. This is five years later. So not only do you have an army campaign, but you also have visitors in the park as well. And so there was some interaction between the two, um, the Nez Perce, the visitors, the Nez Perce, and the US Army, the US Army and the visitors. And there's quite a number of sites. The one site I'm gonna talk about is a mountain bivouac site on the Eastern side of the park. And uh, work was begun in this site in the 2010s. And what they were finding is they were finding remnants of those lodgepole pines that were used in those wickiup and teepee structures. And through dendrochronological analysis, which is counting the tree rings and examining those, and that was conducted by uh, John King of Lone Pine Research, he was able to determine that quite a number of those lodgepole pines were felled late in the growing season of 1877. And when we look at some of the tool marks associated with this site, up on the upper right, you see that those are ax marks that were there. Down on the lower left, these are some of the artifacts that were recovered from that site. We have tinklers, we have um, iron points, iron staples, different military hardware. That handle uh, looks like it's a, a handle from a 1872 pattern mess kit. Um, why would the Nez Perce have some of those items? Well, it was because of those interactions with the tourists earlier before they hit this section of the park up in the mountains on the eastern side. In 2014, they found remnants of a saddle. And in 2015, they returned to excavate the saddle. And these are the different parts of the saddle, the, some of the hardware that was found. Also, also, quite a few leather fragments were found as well. And we're lucky enough that we we're able to receive a grant. So right now, as I'm talking to you, this saddle is being conserved. 
And once it's finished being conserved, it'll be able to come back um, and be here at the park to be put on exhibit and to be analyzed by researchers. This site's really important because for quite a while, we had different accounts of where the Nez Perce were going on the eastern side of the park. Which route did they take? And because of this site, we were able to definitively confirm that this was at least one of the routes, probably the route that the main group took across through the mountains, through the Absorca Mountains. And using that information, we were able to work with the US Forest Service to definitively um, establish a commemorative route for the Nez Perce National Historic Trail through the park. And so in 2017, we were able to do that for the 140th anniversary. And you can walk that commemorative route today to follow that pathway. As I mentioned, we look at the archeology span of tourism. We look at the archeology span not only related to the Nez Perce site, but we also look at it related to the development of tourism within the park. The development of tourism within the park kind of reflects the development of tourism across North America. So we go from stagecoach to uh, motor vehicles to increasing roads, and we follow this through. And so these are a couple of the different artifacts we've been able to find. So on the upper left, these are uh, mineral or ginger ale bottles. And if you notice, they all have rounded bottoms. Well, they have rounded bottoms because the manufacturer, as soon as you open that bottle, you couldn't put it down, so you had to finish it. And if you finished it, then you just had to keep buying more of their product. And we look at this because we wanna know how did the people who were visiting the park and the people who were living here with those early tourism days and the establishment of the park, how do they interact with the wider regional and global economy? On the lower right, this is a scotch bottle from Glasgow, Scotland that was here in the park and it dates somewhere between 1934 and 1964. And so we asked these kinds of questions because when people came, a lot of the journals would talk about what they saw, what their experiences were, where they hiked, but it wouldn't necessarily talk about what they ate. Uh, what kinds of drinks did they do? They may not have mentioned at all, depending on who was writing, whether or not they were participating in drinking scotch. But because of the archeology, span we know that at least some folks were drinking scotch when they were visiting here in the park. Uh, recently in 2018, you may have heard that down at Old Faithful, the ear spring erupted. And out of that eruption, we had the formation of an archeological site. So I do not suggest putting in any way, I do not, please do not put items into geysers, but when that spring erupted, these items came out and it helped us learn more about different time periods. So these items tend to date to the mid 20th century, but you know, sometimes just the smallest one item can really help tell a story. So in the upper right, we have science equipment of a glass funnel and tube, rubber hose and a clamp. And if we look at that, we can really get a picture of being the scientist that was taking the sample and then lost their equipment. Or if you've ever cared for a small child, the pacifier in the lower center. Some poor child lost their pacifier in the 1930s. And so that creates a really close connection to those people of the past. Another thing that we look at is we look at ice patches. And ice patches, unlike glaciers, the glaciers are moving around and they grind as they move and carve the landscape. Ice patches are kinetically stable. They're not moving across the landscape. They will build up and they will recede. And we find archeological sites and some of those materials such as wood that don't survive in other places, these really fragile organic materials held in the ice. And when the ice retreats, it releases these artifacts. And so in the park, we have found artifacts that date to up to 5,000 years old coming out of these ice patches. 
and ancient trees up to 7,500 years old. And we also can find uh, within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, we also find remnants of animal bones. We can figure out what they were hunting. On the lower left, uh, we have a fragment of a dart shaft. So unlike at Osprey Beach, where I don't have those dart shafts, because it was preserved in the ice, I do have one from these ice patches. So we went back up in 2020 and started looking at the ice patches themselves to kind of get a better idea of not only the ice and what's coming out, but how were people interacting with these areas? So in the upper left, that tiny little dot, that is a full-size bull elk that we saw when we were up there. The ice below him stands probably about 10 to 12 feet tall. On the lower left, that's a full-size human male. He's about six feet tall. And on the right, we find, we started documenting some of these stone features. Are these hunting blinds? Are these stone circles? We're trying to figure out what's going on with that. That is not what I would like to do. That is what I'd like to do. And as well, we conducted the first excavations. So working with Dr. Craig Lee out of the University of Colorado, uh, we conducted the first excavations in the park at over 10,000 feet. These are conducted at 10,800 feet. And so this is how I spent part of my summer last year. And we, were, we didn't realize that how far down these artifacts went. And so here's a couple of the different stone tools we were able to recover. Because we want to tell the wider story of how people were using these ice patches. There's not a lot of water sources up there. And so these areas provide water, not only for people to use, but also for animals to use, especially if you're hunting game. And I will tell you, it is much, much cooler up there in the heat of summer than down in the lower elevations. Um, at this point, I do, one of the things that has happened recently within the park, you may have seen uh, last year, we did have uh, our law enforcement, did find somebody excavating and illegally digging in the park. So I do want to remind everybody that taking archaeological resources um, is a federal offense because once those items are removed, we lose that original context. We lose that spatial relationship that helped tells those stories and gives us that understanding of people in the past. But what to do if you find something? If you find something, just leave it where it is. You know, if you want to look at it, what I suggest doing is just putting a toe right where you found it and don't move that foot. And then just record the information. Do you have a map? Can you remember where it was? Do you have GPS? Can you take a photograph with something for scale? Even a coin. I've had water bottles, um, pens, hair ties, something that provides scale. Um, if you see somebody has damaged something, and try to avoid impacting the site, like um, social trails through there or creating a campsite if you're backcountry camping, off trail if you have special permissions for that, um, or putting in such as a toilet or something, and just gather that information and send it to me. And then what I do is I use this information because remember only less than 3% of the, the park has been inventoried and I use this information and we go back to visit these different locations that people have reported to me. And I go back with a lot of different volunteers, of all age groups. So we will go back, we will find the materials again, we will record them. Um, sometimes we'll do excavations by them and we'll just try to learn as much as we can. And we don't just work on field work, we also have people help analyze in the lab. So on the left, uh, Lizzie is analyzing that small point that we found recently at Osprey Beach, while Susie on the right is working on other historic bottles and to learn more about how people were living in this place, using this place, how they were interacting with the resources. And that helps us to better understand the history of this place and to maintain these non-renewable non resources for the future. And so that's just a real cursory glance. Um, I try to cover about 12,000 years of history in about 40 minutes. So 
what I'd like to do is just see if you have uh, questions about anything I've talked about or other uh, topics of archaeology here in Yellowstone. Hi, this is Patty. What, when you've been studying and discovering things, what did you find that negated some previous story or belief or um, history? Did you, did you ever find anything that negated some story that had been around, a significant story? Well, well we, for a long time in the 20th century, because the high elevation areas were difficult to access, some archeologists were, were positing that people didn't really use those high elevation areas. And because of work that's been done by uh, archeologists here in Yellowstone, as well as Grand Teton and other places in the uh, greater Yellowstone ecosystem, both by federal agencies and by university researchers, as well as with volunteers, we've been able to document so many archeological sites that that has contradicted that idea that people weren't using these areas very much. We just, every time I go up, I find more and more and more and more. So there's really a lot of use in these areas. And we're trying to figure out what seasons people were up there, when they were using these areas, uh, were they doing other things besides hunting? And one thing I haven't talked about is we will reach out to our associate associated tribes because they carry the oral traditions of how these areas were being used and what they, what they mean to them. And we take that information as well as the archeological information and we put it together to try to get at that greater understanding. Uh, I have a question, Beth. Um, I'm wondering, Given that much of your research is in the backcountry, uh, have you been able to use any uh, advanced technologies like LIDAR? I was looking at some of your Osprey Beach photos and lots of down timber, which I think would kind of screw up LIDAR. I mean, I don't know that much about it, but would you comment on that? I can. And so... I'm gonna do two comments on that. I wanna address the lighter and I wanna address how most of the work is in the backcountry. The majority of the archeology span that we know about is not in the difficult to access backcountry areas. A lot of it's in the front country. And so um, we focus there because we wanna make sure that with anything that we're doing in the park, that we understand what impacts it could have on archeological resources. Right now, they're doing new LIDAR scans um, of different areas of the park. And so what I will do is, and I haven't shown this before, is I will take that fine LIDAR data and I will overlap it where we have known sites and I will do a spatial analysis of what is known and then extrapolate it to other areas of the park to give me high probability locations for finding archeological sites. For example, one of the things that we've been looking for is bison drives or bison jumps. Mm -hmm. We have them all around the park. We just don't have any identified in the park yet. So we're using that information and that advanced uh, satellite imagery and uh, LIDAR data to try to identify locations that if we're gonna look for these types of um, sites, that that's got the highest probability. So to clarify, so when you're saying most of your, your sites are more front country than back country, is that because that's where you've looked because of development or because you think that historically and prehistorically that the usage of what we now call Yellowstone was primarily along the same routes that we're using today? For both reasons. Uh, coming through this area and across the West, people 
migrated and traveled along rivers and river corridors and water sources. Those same transportation corridors were, many of them were adopted into the trails that we use today, They're walking through the park and through the road corridors because they're following those major river corridors. That's a high probability location for finding archeological sites, but that's also where we have the most development in the park and the most visitor use. And that's why a lot of efforts have been focused in those locations. Now we're trying to look at other areas as well to get a better understanding, a whole more holistic perspective of the landscape. Have I answered your question? Yes, that yes, and that that actually makes sense. Um, and I'll have one more question, and then I'll quit hogging your time. Um, you know, a lot of the visitor centers focus on one thing or another: uh, the, the geothermal activity, the you know various things. It would be nice if at one of the visitor centers somewhere there was a, a lot more about the archaeology of the park. Any thoughts along that line? So uh, in, there are several different exhibits throughout the park on archeology span and um, previous peoples. In Albright Visitor Center, downstairs, there's an exhibit there. I'm sure any because I have Mike Twist, one of the um, visitor center, the lead for Canyon, do you have any in Canyon? We do. We interpret uh, Native people's uh, origin stories as they relate to the thermal features in the Canyon area. Thank you. Yeah, there's different places throughout the park. And so, um, for example, down by Nesper's Ford and Nesper's uh, River, there are uh, waysides that interpret that story. Um, down at Obsidian Cliff, there's outside exhibits that interpret the use of obsidian in that area. And so we're trying to provide opportunities for visitors in many different locations of the park. Here, uh, my office is in the Heritage and Research Center in Gardner. And we have many, many items that uh, the public, uh, members of the associated tribes and researchers all come to use for their research. And if you're interested in that, you just contact the center and make an appointment. And then we have um, archives, museum collections, and the research library here as well. Beth, got a question that came in through chat. Wants to know what we know about year round use within the park versus seasonal use. That's a really good question. Um, a lot of work has been looking at Yellowstone Lake. And one of the thoughts is, were people using Yellowstone Lake only in the spring, summer, and fall, and then migrating to lower elevations? Or were, was Yellowstone Lake being used more year round? Because we're finding archeological sites that are in places that are difficult to get to but we don't have such as some of the islands. We don't have evidence of boats yet. We don't have, um, so how are you gonna to get to the island if you don't have boats? Well, some people say we just don't have remnants of the boats because they were made out of organic materials. And other folks say, well, you know, if you want to hunt bear, it would be easiest to hunt bear while the bear is denning and the ice is frozen and you can just walk across. Um, and then there's the discussion as to uh, the thermal, the geothermal areas. You know, if we're thinking about in the interior of the park versus like places down by Gardner with Boiling River, it's much easier to access. So as far as seasonal versus year round, I think you really need to know, look at what particular location in the park you're looking at. And there's various, ideas from different archaeologists of how and when these areas are being used. And I know that's not a definitive answer, but it's one of those research questions that I find really interesting. And so that helps us learn more about that. Beth, what can you say about the sheep eater 
using the northern end of the park during the winter? So a lot of the archaeology, we can't specifically tie to one particular group because many of the different uh, tool technologies were very similar. As we move closer in time to us, um, talking with different members of the associated tribes, for example, our wiki ups, how they were constructed, it makes a difference if you use two or three center poles, you can kind of link that to a specific group. In the southern portion of the park, we do have something called uh, inner mountain wear, and we also have steatite bowls. Both of those are known to have been used by the Shoshone ethnographically. When we have those items, we can make a pretty good argument or interpretation that those items may have been used by the Shoshone, but I can't say definitively for a lithic workshop that it was Shoshone versus Blackfeet versus Crow versus someone else. So for that, I, I really look to the ethnographic material and the oral traditions to get that broader understanding of more recent time. I think uh, the question was in reference to the north end of the park, uh, not so much was it sheep eater or not, but was there uh, winter use at the north end of the park? It's difficult to determine that. Um, the way that I figure out seasonality or one of the avenues we use for seasonality is we look at uh, floral remains, macrobotanical remains, pollen, you know, certain plants will pollinate at different times of year. And as well as if animals are migrating, you know, if they're only here at one particular time of year, uh, then we can look at them. None of those are really expressed only in winter. But when I talk with different people and I, I, I listen and I sit down and hear a lot of the oral traditions, I'm, I'm informed that people did use the northern area in the winter months. But I, whether I can see that archeologically is difficult. And that's um, some of the difficultness with archeology span is, you know, it's not always written down. But even if it is written down, like where I was talking about with that scotch bottle, not everything is always written down. So archeology span is that, can give that insight to those lives that people maybe aren't talking about. So I really can't speak from an archeological perspective about winter use in the Northern portion of the park. Another question that came in on the chat line, um, do any of the recent human DNA analyses shed any light on anything in reference to Yellowstone National Park? That's a really good question. Um, I do not have uh, DNA analyses for anything that was once found in the park. Um, everything has been uh, repatriated that has ever been found here. The, the DNA analyses that I'm aware of speak to more of a, a much broader continental or massive regional um, movement of peoples. So for that, I would just have to look continent wide for that. I don't have anything that's specifically linked to Yellowstone. Would any of the folks out there have any other questions? Hi, this is Ashia. Um, I do have a question. Thanks, Beth, so much for taking the time to share all this information. We appreciate it. Um, I'm curious, um, I, I, things have changed a lot in, in just even in my years here in terms of relationships with the tribes and, uh, you know, better interpretation and getting information out there. And I've had several conversations recently with some Native friends, uh, both uh, Upsalika, Crow, Tzitzitza, and uh, potentially uh, trying to incorporate a Native village like we see in some other parks, like Yosemite is a really great example. 
Um, I'm curious if also talking about that sort of thing in the park within the park service. Just one Little second, bit. Beth, before you answer. Miriam Watson, uh, could you no, move mute your mic? We're getting a live no, appearance from you. Go ahead, Beth. The floor is back to you. Um, I got some overlap with trying to hear your question. And um, we're fighting with power here now. <laughs> I'm um, just in short, if there's um, the conversations that I've been having with some Native friends about, um, you know, really upping the game in terms of interpretation and being able to welcome tribes back in a little bit more than, you know, I mean, I think things have improved in my years here in terms of interpretation, but um, one of the ideas that I've had conversations about recently has more to do with like an actual native village, like where there's, you know, a living culture, not just like this is what they looked like at mud volcano, you know, even now getting pretty dated or, you know, some of these other uh, interpretations. So I'm um, just curious if, you know, what, what you hear from the Park Service side, if that's something that we could potentially look forward to in the coming years. Well, all of our interpretive um, exhibits and outreach is done through our interpretive division. Uh, but I know that the park is continuously striving to do better to tell these different stories. And I know that they're exploring all different options and the best ways to find the best ways to help tell those stories. I also want to let you know that for some reason my computer thinks it has no power. So if I go away, it's the computer. <laughs> so if there's any other questions, please let me know. I was wondering if there's a lot of rock art or petroglyphs or any of that kind of history. We have uh, pictographs and petroglyphs around the park, but I don't have any yet identified within the park that are definitively um, like pre-contact peoples that were created by them. It would be very difficult for me to say they're all around the park that not within the park. Um, I am always thinking that we might find them someday. I am, would be not surprised if one day a park visitor came to me and said, look what I found when I was out hiking on this trail. And so that's why I'm always putting my information out there of just let me know what you find. But not yet, emphasis on yet, from my opinion. Hi, I'm Brenda. Um, I'm wondering um, if, if all of the research within the park uh, is being done by uh, white folks or, um, or are there also uh, native peoples who are actually doing the work alongside you or, or then or is it just that you go and talk with them about their oral traditions um, as a separate thing? So we try to do everything. So when they were studying the Nez Perce Trail, Nez Perce elders came to visit the park and to tell the stories in those locations. Uh, right now we offer a native student internship to work with the Center for Resources. And I've had students placed with me in archeology span to come work alongside me. I've had students placed in other natural resource programs. Uh, we've also partnered with different um, groups. So for example, this summer, the Salish Kootenai College, they're coming with their students and we're gonna to partner together to look at some new places for archeology span and to do that inventory because I want a diverse perspective. You know, I come from a Western science background, but having an indigenous, what we call indigenous archeology span and bringing in those other perspectives, just give a richer, richer understanding. So I try to partner as much as possible to be able to do that. Um, and we're always open um, for 
those who are interested, they can come and do research permits with us. You know, you don't have to just partner with me. You can apply for research permits to do work in the park. Um, but we also try to do as much outreach as possible, realizing that, hey, maybe a lot of the elders can't walk with me to these different places, but they can talk to me about these different places. So then I'm trying to get a better sense of the importance of these places and what does it mean to the associated tribes. So I try to do all of the above when possible. Great, thank you. I've got another question out of the chat window for you there, Beth. Uh, okay. Is there any evidence of culturally modified thermal features? And the question said culturally modified. I kind of, to me, it comes to mind of, uh, oh, say since we were uh, became a park, but how about before and after we became a park as part of that question? That's a good question. I, so besides ear spring or something that's modified during more modern eras by something like vandalism, like that, archeologically, it's hard to see because these geothermal features are very dynamic. And so if they were once with the buildup of geyserite or some of the other materials, it may not be present, it may not be visible to me as an archeologist, as well as since there's so much of the park to inventory, doing work here is I always maintain that safety aspect in my mind of making sure that I'm staying far enough away from the larger animals and far enough away from those geothermal features because they are very, very fragile. And so I don't wanna impact them either. So since it's such a dynamic environment, I don't have evidence of like pre-contact, also known as prehistoric modification of those geothermal areas. I do have archeological sites that are around them. And that's where I've been focusing most of the work that, that I've been doing. Anybody else there got something on their mind? Another good question, please. Well, it looks like we're kind of questioned out, Beth. Let me thank you very much. I know the people really enjoyed this and really ate it up uh, for the information you had there. I see some hands going up. And uh, Shauna, I see your hand. Is that a clapping hand or do you have a question there, Shauna? It's just a clapping hand. Thank you so much, Beth, for doing this tonight. Well, let me invite all of you. We are lucky enough that we have um, two. We have two exhibits in the Heritage and Research Center in the lobby on ice patch archaeology, including items on display. And so, when we are able to be fully operational again, those exhibits will be here through September of what year is this? Twenty one. <laughs> And so I hope that we'll be fully operational then. And please come, if you're here, come visit those exhibits and see those items. You, if you would like to see them before we're fully operational, just contact us and make an appointment to see them. I think I got another question coming in. Colette, do you have a question? Thank you, yeah, I was trying to type it in, but I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Is, I wanna know if the weir at Bridge Bay, near Bridge Bay on the lake, is a cultural site? That's a good question. Thank you. And so that, that's one I've been going around with myself. Um, one of the things is some of the, the weirs or something that looks like a line of, of, of um, so a fish weir would be you put up a line of, uh, Sticks is not the word I'm looking for. Poles, Poles thank you. And then you, know, you could capture fish as the water is moving. Sometimes sites in other locations in the US that have been identified as fish weirs, when they've done the excavation, they found that it's actually an old berry tree that 
gone down and has its limbs sticking up. Um, other times they're fish weirs. I have not done the excavation work at that location to determine what's going on below the, the ground surface. We don't have, if you think about the coastlines um, where I've done, I've done excavation work on the coastlines where we have that tide, I have a low tide and a high tide. Here, I don't really have that to get in there. So as soon as we start work, it kind of, the water can come in. And so I want, before I do something like that, I wanna be very, very careful that I don't inadvertently impact any critical information that could answer your question, which is the same question I have, to be honest with you, kind of what's going on there. And so rather than just jumping in, I like to think about it very carefully because if it is a fishware, it's gonna be a very rare resource known in the park so far and it's non-renewable. So if I'm going to examine it, I need to do it in the way that's gonna be sensitive and be able to obtain as much data as possible. So I don't have a yes or no for you, unfortunately. Somebody will though someday. Anybody else, last chance to get your questions in there. Well, again, let me thank you, Beth. Uh, we'll call the official end to the program coming on now. Uh, I would remind people that of all the programs we've done, if you will go to our YouTube channel, go to YouTube, search on Gathering a Naturalist, you will find the videos archived of the different programs. And this one will have up, oh, hopefully by about Tuesday. And it's the, the series of Gathering a Naturalist over the Zoom era has been quite impressive for the amount of knowledge our presenters have given us and stored. This is your own series of training sessions about the park. And please folks, go to YouTube, go to the channel, Gathering a Naturalist, give us a like there and stay tuned for next fall. We'll make another go then. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to social hour again. And thank you very much, Beth. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this program. If you like the program, we have a channel on YouTube. Go to YouTube and search for Gathering a Naturalist. You may also visit our website at tracknature.com where you'll find our books, classes, and other products. Our books are available on amazon.com. Again, thank you for joining us. And this is Jim Halfpenny. Take care my friends. <laughs>